Well, you must have known that the other shoe had to drop after we spent quite some time in Hebrews 6 verses 1 through 3 looking at the real Bible proposed elementary principles. We now are going to do what they said to do. You may recall it said there, we will press on to maturity, not laying again the foundations of these elementary principles, which we will do if God permits. Well, you and I live in a time where we do have time, at least we have had time so far, uh, during which we have looked at these kinds of principles. But it's time to move on to maturity, um, understanding that, of course, the things that are listed in Hebrews 6, 1 through 3, are not commonly held to be elementary principles, but they are. Uh, especially, I would say, laying on of hands, which clearly has to do with what we approve and what we go along with. Uh, today, people call that fellowship. What do you have fellowship with or who? But in the New Testament, they called it laying on of hands. When they brought children to Jesus and the disciples said, oh, no, don't, you know, get this out of here, no riffraff. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Of such persons is the kingdom of God. And he laid hands on them. It shows that they're approved. It shows that they are acceptable. And he has fellowship with them, not only fellowship with them, but they're the kind of people that the church is to be made out of. So laying on of hands, you know, what, what do you approve? What do you have fellowship with? That's an, that's an elementary principle in the way that the Bible prescribes in Hebrews chapter 6. Not solid food, as I thought for so long. I thought, oh, fellowship teaching, that's very hard. People have a hard time with that. No, they shouldn't. There's nothing hard about it. It's just that they don't want to do it. <laughs> that's all. It's an elementary principle. It's a foundational thing. And so long as people are struggling with that, they won't be able to move on to the rest. That's all that Hebrews is trying to say in chapters 5 and 6 with regard to your need to mature with your sluggish ears. But we do need to press on to maturity, not preach again that series of lessons, although I recommend that you check them out at southaustinchurchofchrist.org. We will press on to maturity now. With the first thing that is noted in Hebrews chapter 6, the sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. There is a pattern that is laid down for us right at the start of this idea that we're pressing on to maturity. Here is the pattern. It's Hebrews 6 verses 13 to 15. When God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. When he said, surely I will bless you and multiply you. Thus, Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. Uh, and we know, certainly, Abraham did patiently wait. This did not happen for him immediately and uh, did not happen for him even within the space of just a few years. This is a lifetime. But he did come to see that he had children and children's children. And he was blessed by God through life and multiplied. God made a promise. God swore by himself. There's nothing greater than God. And Abraham had to have patience and wait. But having done so, the promise was valid. He got it. This is the pattern. And it's the pattern over and again in Hebrews. That's what this is about in the final analysis. Well, there's a couple of things we should look at in this particular account of the promise made to Abraham and how this pattern is established. We have two unchangeable things to look at, first of all, in Hebrews 6, verse 14 is where it was recorded, surely I will bless you and multiply you. The reason for that is that this word, surely I will, this is an oath. This is a, a sworn testimony. Uh, when they say surely in the Old Testament like that in Hebrew, it's an oath. 
So when he says, surely I will bless you, not just I will bless you, this means I swear I will bless you. God can swear. As Jesus taught us, you and I don't have the power to swear. We cannot change the hairs of our heads. And we can't swear by heaven, it's God's throne, or by earth, it's his footstool, it's not ours. The things that are ours, our hair, we can't change. Our stature or lifespan, we cannot change. But God can swear, and he did. I swear, I'll bless you and multiply you. 16th verse of Hebrews 6, people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. Yeah, people use swearing. That's why you are sworn in before giving testimony in a court of law. Uh, people are use oaths to affirm what they are doing. You're, you're effectively signing or swearing to an oath when you sign a contract. So, in the 17th verse, in the 18th verse, when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. So again, the pattern is God promises and he swears and he makes good on that promise. We are, we are to pay, be patient through life and we'll inherit it. That's the pattern. Two unchangeable things here. First thing is he wants to make it more convincing. He wants to make it very clear to us, the heirs of that promise, that he has an unchangeable character of purpose. And it's true. One unchangeable thing is God's character. The other, he cannot lie. So when he says, I will do it, that's unchangeable. When he says, I swear, I will do it, that's unchangeable. But it's, uh, you know, belt and suspenders. Right? This is double sure. We who have fled for refuge should have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. That's the idea. We gain from the knowledge of God's power, the knowledge of God's character and unchangeable purpose, the strength that we need, the encouragement that we need to hold fast. Uh, when we speak of his uh, unchangeable character, an unchangeable purpose, we mean he intends to save. His purpose is to save. And it has been from the beginning. Will everybody be saved? No, only him who does the will of the Father. But God wants everybody to be saved. He wants all people to come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. The earth has not been destroyed yet because God is patient not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So that's an unchangeable character. God's not going to change his mind or renege on the contract is what this really is saying. God has entered into a contract and he's not going to renege. This is a promise that he intends to save people and he is going to do that. You will be saved. If you also, for your part, abide by the terms of that contract. Hold fast is necessary because it's not a simple matter to hold on to the hope set before you. There are setbacks. There are trials. Things are hard. There are things you want to do that God doesn't allow you to do. But there are pressures to stop serving him or not serve him so well with not so much resolution, not so much uh, effort, not so much um, visibility. No, it's difficult to hold fast. We need that strong encouragement. All right. So the next thing is in this point that he makes, the 19th and 20th verses of Hebrews 6, 
we have this, this guaranteed purpose by oath, you see, this unchangeable character. We have this encouragement as a sure and a steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a, as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, you understand, is the closing structure that's the other side of the envelope that was opened in Hebrews chapter 5. Remember, he started to speak about that Jesus was, uh, did not take the honor upon himself to be called a priest, but the honor was bestowed upon him by the one who appointed him, saying, I have made you a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And then he interrupted himself, saying, About whom we have a lot to say, and with great difficulty, because you have become sluggish of hearing, and you need to learn again the elementary principles of the, of the doctrine of Christ. Right, that's the whole trip that happened there in chapter 5 closing and chapter 6 opening. We're back to where we started. Jesus has gone into the inner place behind the curtain on our behalf, a forerunner having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He is the high priest. He is a forever priest. He lives forever. And this is a sure and a steadfast anchor of the soul. An anchor, I think everybody knows what an anchor is, but, you know, it keeps the ship in place. <laughs> it keeps you where you intend to be. You stay there regardless of the current, the wind, the storms, whatever happens, the anchor keeps the boat in place. Jesus goes a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. So things happen, you know, because the anchor is overboard, or the anchor has been let down or has been cast, whatever you call it, doesn't mean that there are no waves. <laughs> doesn't mean there is no wind. It doesn't mean there are no storms. Uh, right? It doesn't mean there is no darkness. Uh, things happen still, but you do have an anchor that keeps you relatively in place and lets you weather that storm. Jesus is that anchor, sure and steadfast. It is a hope. That hope is Jesus, of course. He's the Christ, the Son of God, but He is in the flesh. He has flesh as you and I have flesh. He's tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. That gives us hope that this can be done. You can overcome. He's raised from the dead. We have hope that we can be raised from the dead. Death is not the worst thing that can happen to you. Condemnation in the devil's hell is the worst thing that can happen to you. Death might even be good. There are situations in this world that are horrible, unimaginable, and death is to be preferred. When you're a Christian, well, you, you are with God when life is done. So no, uh, there is a hope in the Lord that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. Somebody has direct access, is what we're saying. In the Old Testament, the curtain was you know, before the holiest of holies. And the Ark of the Covenant was in there and the mercy seat was in there. You know, everything that represented access to God was behind a curtain. But we have a hope that enters into that inner place behind the curtain where by prescription of the law of Moses, only the high priest could go and only once a year on the Day of Atonement. But Jesus has gone there a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever by the order of Melchizedek. So we have a hope. We enter this, you know, if you will, this sacred holiest of holies. We have boldness to come to God through our Lord Jesus. A hope that enters the inner place, sure and steadfast. Let's talk about sure.
in Acts 21 at verse 34, the word that is used for sure in uh, Hebrews 6, 19. It's a word, it's a Greek word, asphale, from which we get asphalt, because asphalt is solid ground. The intent of asphalt is that you don't fall. Of course, when you do fall on asphalt, it hurts a lot. But the idea is it should be grippy and not like a rocky terrain. Well, asphalt is a, is a, a safe, a sure, uh, a solid thing. It gets used in Acts 21, 34 in this way. Some of the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. You may remember there was a riot at the uh, temple of uh, Diana, as it's always translated. I don't know why, it's Artemis. Some of the crowd shouted one thing, some another, and the person in charge couldn't learn the facts because of the uproar. The word, the facts, that's the asphalt. That's the safe thing, the solid thing, the material. The reality, the facts. He couldn't tell what was sure. <laughs> they were saying one thing, they were saying another. That means we're not sure what the truth is there. He couldn't establish what was firm, what was sure, what was definite. In Acts 22, 30, when Paul is imprisoned, they still don't know why. <laughs> And the judge calls for some help. He brings in a contractor. That's how you know it's not going to work. But Acts 22, 30, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he brought Paul down and set him before them. The real reason why is our asphalt word. There is that safe, secure, you know, solid thing. What is the reality here? What are the facts here? He wants to know what's the real reason that they're being accused, or he's being accused. What is this really about? Which, to be fair, is good. A judge should be trying to figure that out. What is this really about? On the other side of that, in 2526, another judge says something very similar. I have nothing definite to write to the appellate court about him. Therefore, I have brought him before you all so that after we have examined him, I may have something to write. When he says nothing definite, there's our word again. You know, there's, I, I can't point to some law that Paul has broken. Uh, and the people that come and say things about him say different things every time. There's nothing certain that I can put down here as the charge for the appellate court. Like, why did this leave? <laughs> How come you couldn't handle this? Right? And that all makes sense in the context of a court. But I think that you also can understand how it makes sense in the context of Hebrews 6. If we have a hope that is sure, we mean... It is real, it is factual, it is certain, it is safe, it is established, it is known and knowable, right? And in fact, it's used that way in Philippians 3, verse 1, when Paul says to them, Brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. You know, it's fine for him to write a letter and it repeats what he said in person. No trouble for him and safe for them. Well, safe for you and me too. We now have a good record of what he said to them at Philippi, writing the same things. No trouble for him, good. We needed this letter, you and I did. We weren't there as they were. But he said it's safe for you, it's, it's good, because it's clear we establish the facts this way, you see. We have the surety of God's word. As sure as these letters are the word of God. They're inspired. Our hope that enters into the holiest of holies is sure. That's what we're getting at. 
Now the other thing that Hebrews says is that it's steadfast. What does steadfast mean? Hmm. Well, we'll go to Romans 4 and verse 16. Really, this is kind of a, this word is the word or is related to our concept of stereo. Um, one of the reasons that we have two ears is directionality, location. You cannot tell where a sound is coming from with only one ear. You have to have two. You have to have stereo hearing in order to establish directionality. I don't know whether this is behind me or in front of me or off to the side. Uh, if you've never tried that before, you can, you know, cover your ear, use the lobe that God gave you and push it down. Don't put anything inside. <laughs> and, and give that a shot. Or when you're in the car next time, you know, crack the back window or the, or the passenger window and none of the others and try to tell where the train is or the siren or the traffic, right? You can tell, you gotta have two inputs to establish where things are coming from. That's the idea behind this uh, steadfast. When you fasten something, you know, it's one thing to tie around one peg. If you've got two of them though, that's even more better. Right, if, 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 a, if a door has got a, a rope and you fasten it around something, well, that, that's good. But if the door has a fastener where there's rope tied around it and it's fastened to another fastener that has rope around it, now that's really sure. That's steadfast. Here, we use it in Romans 4.16 to say guaranteed. Salvation depends on faith so that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, as opposed to the law of Moses, which is not by faith. Faith is in Christ Jesus and in the word that God inspired through the apostles. The law is not by faith. The law of Moses is a different thing. The grace and the promise is guaranteed to all his offspring, not just to Abraham, or not rather just to um, the people of Israel. But the idea of the guarantee is steadfast. Our hope is guaranteed to all offspring. And this is a reference to Abraham, to whom this promise was first made. Romans 4 is. But Hebrews 6 was talking about Abraham too. And he was talking about the fact that Abraham patiently endured and obtained the promise that God swore to and that we will too. Here in Romans 4, he's saying, yes, and that's going to be through Christ Jesus, not through the law of Moses. It's guaranteed for everybody who is a child of Abraham, which is those who are his children by faith. Right? Without going too far afield into Galatians, that's what he's saying, isn't it? One child is the child of promise, who came by miraculous means through Sarah, but he had had first another child in the normal way of having children, but who is the heir? Isaac is the heir, not Ishmael. The spiritual overtakes the physical. The guarantee is by the spiritual, not by the physical lineage. In Hebrews 3 and verse 14, the, uh, the same word was used there. He says, we've come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm until the end. So hang on. There are going to be waves. There's going to be wind. Do not be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Hold confidence firm to the end. But then 2 Peter is the other place that I really like with regard to steadfastness. 2 Peter 1 verses 10 and verse, uh, verse 10 and verse 19. He said, Brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. 
If you practice these qualities, you'll never fall. He just gave a building block, a pyramid, you know, we've gone over, many people have gone over probably many times in life about how you build on top of your faith and how you grow in the Lord. If these are yours and increasing, you'll never fall. Here he says, if you practice these, you never fall. But he said, be diligent all the more to confirm your calling and election. That's a reaffirmation or, a, you know, double knot, right? Double sure. God swore twice, you fasten twice. <laughs> or hang on with both hands, or listen with both ears. Right? However you want to look at that, there's, they're all uh, valid imagery in ancient Greek. It's used in all those ways. And in the 19th, he said, we, the apostles, have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. So we confirm our calling and election by practicing these qualities, which he said are truths he reminds us of, though we're already established in them and know them. And in the 19th, he said, we apostles have that prophetic word more fully confirmed. So how are you confirming? Well, you're doing it through the word of God. The word is the means by which we accomplish this. And their word is the steadfast thing, the proven thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, let's go behind the curtain in Matthew 27. This is the last thing we'll look at this morning. In Matthew 27, verse 50, records the death of our Lord on the cross. He cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. When the centurion, verse 54, records, and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. Well, true. The centurion, the Roman head of a hundred soldiers, basically the chief in town, had seen many crucifixions in his time, but nothing like this. They never saw what happened to Jesus. That's an interesting thing that he would say when we speak of an earthquake and then being filled with awe. But back here in the 50th and 51st verses, here is our curtain. The, and the hope that enters behind the curtain or the veil. It's the curtain of the temple that is torn in two from top to bottom. Why is that? Well, it signifies that the entrance is open. It's no longer veiled. It's no longer covered. It's open now. You can get in. Because Jesus has given the sacrifice. He has inaugurated the way in his blood. But there's more to it. There's much more to it. In Hebrews 10. Which, this is the thing that I found most surprising in the study, and that's why it's the last thing, and it also is a call for each one of us to obey the gospel. But Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 22. Since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. Did you catch that in Hebrews 10?
There is a new and a living way by which we enter the holy places with confidence. It was opened by the Lord through the curtain that is through his flesh. I never noticed that before, but that is very powerful. The curtain is his flesh. The law was stopped and powerless because of flesh, but the Lord came in the flesh, paraphrasing Romans 8, but the Lord came in the flesh to accomplish the righteous requirement of the law, and he did so. To bring, as uh, it's written elsewhere in Hebrews, uh, a body you have prepared for me. I've come to do all that is written in the volume of this book. He became the sacrifice for sin. His body is, his flesh is the curtain. You know, John chapter 1 says, uh, you know, he dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. I believe it's 14th verse. And he dwelt among us is such a poor translation. The word there is he pitched his tent among us. Which, yes, is a uh, figure of speech for dwelling among us when you are a society of, of tent dwellers. But I think it's a very pregnant figure of speech when we're talking about the tent of the Lord, the tabernacle, the feast of booths or tents. You know, the tabernacle itself is made of animal skins. Right? That's the skins all around on the outside. When you looked at the tent, it wasn't painted, it wasn't adorned with gold, it looked like any other tent. Just skin and flesh like anything else. But inside the tabernacle, the tent of God, there was gold and precious things. Jesus also had flesh as you and I have flesh. No different from any other person to look upon him. But on the inside, he had the Holy Spirit of God. That curtain was ripped when his flesh was destroyed. That's what happened. This man is the great high priest over the house of God. And because of him, we can draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, bodies washed with pure water. Hearts are sprinkled clean from an evil conscience by the blood of Jesus, our priest, who sacrificed himself for us. Bodies are washed with pure water insofar as they are baptized. It's not power in the water. It's not the removal of dirt from the flesh, 1 Peter 3, 21 tells you. It is the appeal to God for the good conscience. That's why the heart is sprinkled with blood. But water is required to obey the gospel of Jesus. In Acts 10, Peter said, who can forbid water that these should be baptized? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Have you been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus? Well, if you haven't been baptized in water, you haven't. That's what they did in Acts 10. Why isn't that what you did? Here we find in Hebrews a very clear compilation of things. We draw near when the heart is true. The assurance we have is our faith in God, not that we are Jewish or that we are keeping the law, but that we believe his word in the New Testament and the Old. Our hearts are cleaned by the blood of Christ, which is obtained in the water of baptism for forgiveness of sins. When you do this, you are a Christian, a child of God, and now you have access through the Lord Jesus far greater than anything that the law of Moses provided, far greater than anything that we deserve. This is grace. It's the grace of God that we have this, and glory be to him for it. He should be praised. He deserves all praise and thanksgiving. He has been so very kind to us. Won't you return thanksgiving to God by obeying the gospel, putting him first in your life, becoming a Christian, a child of God, living for him from now on who gave his life for you? We have water here prepared, garments prepared, that you might be baptized in his name. 
If today you are a Christian who has not lived right, we'll repent, make things right with God, get back on track. Let us help you with our prayers on your behalf that you might come to God again and be restored to your rightful place and join hands with us and that we might be encouraged by your faith and, and your repentance. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let that need be known now by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song that's been selected.